Get a Book Dot today presents Strike Battleship Argent, Book One in the Starships at War series by Shane Lachlan Black, copyright 2016. Stand by for action. Want new bonus chapters? Of course! Everyone wants bonus chapters! If you like what you see in here, give us a super thanks. Buttons are below every video. Every super thanks goes directly to new science fiction. Don't miss our action premieres where you can enjoy the story live. Want to rank up and get special recognition? Become a channel member. You might even become an honorary Skywatch Marine. Join us, subscribe, hit the notification bell, like and comment, and don't forget to visit the bookstore where you will find my latest books and one-of-a-kind officially licensed gear. All ahead, battle speed! I have a heavy energy reading bearing 060 range 70 yards. It's right below us. Yili spoke evenly and quietly into the comlink pickup. Zoni nodded. The two officers kept themselves pinned against the cool metal surface of the subterranean bulkhead. They were on the third sublevel of what they both guessed was the station's easternmost wing. So far, they hadn't seen any other personnel, which was disturbing on a number of levels. Why was the location they had just visited guarded by two people while the rest of the station seemed to be deserted? Zoni was listening intently for any unusual noises, but even her rather sensitive hearing wasn't able to detect anything except a pleasant hum that seemed to emanate from the very structure itself. Yili suspected this was coming from the station's power source. She also suspected the reason nobody had come to greet them so far was because they were waiting until the optimal moment to take them prisoner, instead of risking one or both of them. Having the Argent's chief engineer and signals officer in custody would make things that much more difficult for Captain Hunter and his battle group. It's the kind of thing Yili would have encouraged Hunter to do if the tables were turned. Just then, Zoni heard the unmistakable sound of a human voice. By now, they had reached sub-level 5 and were able to move laterally far enough out to the edge of the gantry to see clearly down into the underground chamber. The cold, stark glow of electrical lighting washed out all the colors, but Yili's guess as to the purpose of the facility was confirmed when she saw the upper edge of a capacitor shell. A shadow moved past one of the lights. Set your weapons on stun. If possible, I want one of these guys conscious so I can get some information about this system. Yili said quietly. A moment later, a man dressed in service overalls and wearing a hard cover emerged from a doorway just across from where Yili and Zoni were concealed. He looked up and froze just long enough for Yili to finish making the modifications to her weapon. His shout was cut off by an ozone-scented flash of light. His handheld clattered to the metal deck and his relatively heavy body followed. Lieutenant Curtis moved forward and rolled him over. The burnt rip in his technician's clothes was still sizzling. Finding nothing of value, Yili retrieved his handheld and moved across the level 5 platform towards the next flight of steps down. Before descending, she stopped to examine the unit. This guy was taking ambient energy readings, she said quietly. Looking for stray antimatter particles, they've got a conversion reactor down here somewhere. That's more advanced than our ships, Zoni whispered urgently. Yup and it makes a neat little power source for that gun. That capacitor housing seals the deal. This thing should be fully operational unless they broke something or aren't done activating the power systems yet. Not we need to find out how many people are manning this station, Zoni said. If there's only a skeleton crew, maybe we can do exactly what you said and get the skipper his trump card. Agreed. If this station is built the way I suspect, the control mechanisms are going to be relatively high up in the structure. That way, they always have the option to seal off the entire reactor mechanism from above and do it with minimum power requirements. Always better to let gravity do your work for you. The natural gravity rating here is only 0.21. Must have built this place the old-fashioned way, then. How's that? Weld five doors together instead of using one. Yili grinned and Zoni almost laughed. You know, that gives me an idea. If we can find the control systems to seal off the lower sublevels, we might be able to trap most of their manpower below and save ourselves the trouble of shooting them all. Can't they just turn off our power? 
Not unless they want to suffocate and freeze to death down there. If I can get 20 minutes with their main junction lines, I can cut off their ability to override the security systems and put us in control of the gun without firing a shot. Are you trying to be silly? Zoni asked. Yili raised an eyebrow. Never, why? Just how many sublevels does this place have? Zoni asked as she peered over the edge of the gantry platform. A moment later, all the lights shifted red and a high-energy alert klaxon began to sound. The two Argent officers looked at each other for a soundless moment, and then they bolted back to where they had stunned the unfortunate technician. From below, they heard shouts and footsteps banging on the metal stairs. Did we set off an alarm or something? Zoni shouted. Nobody was going to hear her beyond a range of about ten yards over the klaxon, so she figured it was past the time to try and be sneaky. Whatever is going on, it wasn't us, Yili shouted back. She grabbed the unconscious man's heels and lifted them up. Zoni snagged the shoulder straps of his overalls. Together, they dragged him into the small heat exchange terminal he had originally emerged from. Yili barred the hatch and locked it from the inside. She produced a universal leverage tool from one of the pockets on her own electrician's vest and rapidly disabled the outer indicator console. Everything went dark except the backlight for the environmental controls next to the hatch. The stunned technician started to wake up. Yili cocked one of her blasters and pointed it at his face. By the time his eyes opened, footsteps were clattering by outside. He saw the business end of the Argent engineer's pistol and his eyes went wide. Yili put her finger to her lips and winked. The clattering outside faded. Who the hell are you people? He whispered angrily. This is a Skywatch military operation. Oh? Yili replied sarcastically. What Skywatch? The man hesitated, his eyes bulging. It seemed like he had a lot to say initially, but had suddenly decided he might have already said too much. Is Skywatch in the habit of building planet-sized gun installations out in the middle of nowhere these days? Zoni asked. We had to protect... Protect what? Humanity! The man looked back and forth between the two officers. Just whose side are you two on? Chapter 70 New contact, 0.0, .0 evasive. The atavistic reflex to duck seized the entire bridge crew as an unidentified Corsair warship filled the forward observation bays of DSS Dunkirk momentarily and then vanished, leaving only a brief memory of the enormous stylized golden condor painted on its ventral hull. DeMay's pilot engaged the vessel's quiescent drive field and threw the engines over into a hasty counterthrust. The resulting back pressure sheared against the strike cruiser's stabilizing magnetic field and caused the hull to shudder. Powerful electromagnetic waves pulsed in all directions from the ship's battle-caliber deflector systems and bolts of high-energy plasma spidered into space, scorching the surfaces of at least a half-dozen passing asteroids. The navigational equivalent of a screeching halt ended with Dunkirk stopped just inside the leading edge of the debris field less than 12 miles from a Class III ferret monster asteroid tumbling towards them at an alarming rate. A moment later, something hit the hull hard enough to make the entire ship ring. The intraship beeped. What the hell was that? The voice of Commander DeMay sounded modulated. Static began to pop and crackle over the channel. Give me outer hull views, Lieutenant Austin snapped. Starboard edge, all cameras on screen. The acting tactical officer complied, routing the views from all of Dunkirk's starboard hull cameras to the MC and then displaying them in a grid that filled the bridge main viewer. That's it. Switch to camera 16. The view of Dunkirk's starboard quarter filled the screen. The ship's hull filled the lower corner. Along the opposite edge of the view, the sharp hard point of an unidentified vessel could be seen stopped in space only a few yards from the camera. On the surface of the strike cruiser's hull, an old-style combat drone worked furiously, cutting an elevator door-sized hole in the thick metal composite. The intrusion detection alarm sounded for just over two seconds, then was abruptly silenced. A moment later, the bridge lights went out. Emergency lights. Bridge, report. Commander. We have an unidentified contact near our starboard quarter. Austin tried to bring up the life support control console, but everything on the bridge was dark. We have lost all power on the bridge. Pilot does not have positive control at the con. I believe we have been boarded. In the huge ship's weapons bay, the acting commander stared at the two technicians with whom he had only minutes ago celebrated the defeat of the pursuing destroyers. 
The momentary hesitation gave way to the sudden and urgent realization he was likely outnumbered and about to lose control of the only hope Argent's battle group had to survive another day. He bolted for the access corridor. As the commander ran down metal passage after metal passage, Lieutenant Austin's voice reverberated throughout the ship, repeatedly requesting DeMay's response to the intraship signal. By now, the intruder protocols should have activated, and they hadn't. DeMay's only hope was to reach the Alpha Junction and cut off all the control mechanisms below B-Deck. The problem was, even if he managed to restore some level of control, the bridge circuits had either been shorted, cut, or burned to ash by now. It would take hours to get Dunkirk underway again, and even that would likely require a full damage control party, which would outnumber the standing crew two to one. In their rush, the Argent and Dunkirk command details had overlooked one very important thing out of necessity. It wasn't because they were careless. It was because it would have simply taken too long to configure. Toby DeMay didn't have a command computer. Had there been time to replace the components and spin up a new system, defeating a boarding party would have been child's play. Now instead, it was a life-or-death race to G-Deck and the all-important Alpha Junction. But first he had to kill the control circuits. His footsteps echoed and vacuum locks expired and resealed on hatch after hatch. He passed at least two jagged wounds along the bulkheads dividing auxiliary life support from the Alpha circuitry conduits that fed power from the lower levels to the nearby control systems. Both were covered in worn-out-looking extra machinery of some kind. Debris was scattered all over the floor. Finally, DeMay rounded a corner and caught just a glimpse of brightly colored feathers. He lunged back and slammed against the bulkhead. The blade of a polished sword put pressure just under his jaw and forced him to his toes. He kept catching his breath, but the exertion pushed him to exhale. Sweat trickled. The slender-gloved hand around the weapon's hilt tightened. Her face was momentarily hidden underneath her wide-brimmed hat. Then she locked gazes with DeMay. She wore all black except for a pair of devilishly attractive maroon boots and a white frill around her collar. On her hip was a dangerous-looking black graphite-coated slug thrower. She wore no recognizable rank or unit insignia, even though there were numerous alien-looking badges and crests. Nevertheless, she was unmistakably a human female with the curves to prove it. Behind her, a not terribly legitimate-looking technician was cutting through another bulkhead with a portable laser torch. Honored, Commander. Her cat-like eyes twinkled with playful menace. DeMay took a breath to speak. Don't bother warning me about the security detail, she quipped. There are eight unfortunate souls on this ship. None are Marines, and I have their captain. She nimbly disarmed the commander with her free hand and gave the sidearm to a man standing nearby casual observers might have described as a cross between a hairless gorilla and an attack dog. He wore a bandolier filled with formidable knives and an inelegant metal collar apparently meant to compensate for his lack of hair. On his back was a highly illegal Talon Z rifle. A moment later, another man arrived. This one was shorter and a bit more stylishly dressed. Engineering, Alpha Junction, and life support secured. We have all major systems keyed to our control. We've taken her a prize. Very well. Order Smallbird to picket course two, the young woman replied. Then she turned her attention back to her prisoner. If I recall, the proper Skywatch protocol is, you're relieved, Captain. Chapter 71 The fleet-wide alert tone sounded on nine Perseus command nets at once. A moment later, Argent's second watch signals officer keyed the voice channels. Attention all stations. Attention all stations. This is Argent Force Command on priority frequency. Engage battle conference on this channel and stand by for a message from the flag. Hundreds of view screens on nine ships snapped to life with a high resolution and high contrast version of DSS Argent's crest. Once all stations had acknowledged, the images of the skippers of the other ships in Jason Hunter's strike force were arranged in a grid and displayed on all the secondary screens. The tenth ship did not respond. Hunter turned in his chair and motioned to the signals board operator. Raise the Dunkirk as soon as possible. They may be getting interference from the asteroid field. After waiting the customary few seconds for the conference net to synchronize, the signals operator nodded. Good morning, boys and girls. It's time for us to put our plan into action, such as it is. King 2 is 20 minutes behind us, and although they are still running with drive fields up, I expect it won't be long before they start trying to close the distance. They know what happened the last time they fired on my ship without provocation, so I expect they'll be loaded for bear and ready for anything. 
Commander Hunter spoke up. I presume we'll be running for the same waypoints to come around on the high side of the steel wheel? The tactical plot replaced the video grid momentarily. Correct. We will run at standard configurations to point uniform tango, then launch skirmishers, drop our fields and make a continuous acceleration run for victory tango. If we time it right and keep a tight formation, we should reach point whiskey tango in about 14 hours. By then, I expect one or more of our landing parties will have secured the battle station, and we'll have it out on the east beach about one megaclick from the gun. Commander Flynn? Sir? Raymond Flynn responded from the bridge of the constellation. Commander Hunter tells me you and Commander Harcourt are our long-range combat specialists. What are your recommendations for dealing with our opponents? Our advantages offset whether we stay at range or close, sir, Harcourt replied from DSS Ajax's weapons bay. Behind him, Cruz worked frantically, preparing his tough little ship's sophisticated anti-missile hardware. King 2 has the advantage in long-range firepower and strike capabilities. We're better suited for a bar fight. Explain. I'm vaguely familiar with Task Force Poseidon. The King's Blade anchors a team of three specialized capital missile platforms. Their screening vessels are there to keep those bigger ships alive so they can do what they do best. Orca and Task Force Hades do roughly the same thing, except they send fighters instead of missiles. If they get both formations close enough, they'll eventually wear us down with numbers. One at a time, they're manageable. They can outgun us, and since they've got a huge standoff arsenal, they don't have to outrun us. They can just rotate fighter strikes and hope a lucky torpedo hit penetrates our anti-fighter screen, Flynn added. It should be noted King's Blade and her group can outrun the Orca's formation. The heavy carriers in Orca's class just aren't set up for running and gunning. So the operative question becomes, is there any way to split that force between here and Whiskey Tango? Commander Teller asked from aboard the Spruants. Not likely unless we split ours, Commander Hunter replied. Or if they are reckless enough to send one of their capital platforms after Dunkirk and the battle station. As long as they stick together, they have the advantage at range. Then perhaps we should reconsider closing range and taking them on head to head, Jason said. Bold but risky, Harcourt replied. Even though I doubt they would be prepared for it, and even though I estimate we could score mission kills on at least two of their missile cruisers, I'm forced to agree with Commander Hunter. The Agamemnon was one thing. Those two beasts out there are firepower-packed blocks of muscle and angry. The Kingsblade has a gigantic main battery designed for planetary assaults. She could get a half-dozen alpha strikes off in the time it would take to close range. The only ship in our formation that can take that kind of punishment is Argent, and with all due respect, that's why yours is the last ship they'll target. So we're back to the original plan, Hunter began. Go round the horn and hope one of their capital formations breaks off to race through the asteroid field and try to cut us off. And hope we can survive whatever they throw at us in the next 14 hours, Jace concluded. If only we had a bigger diversion than just the Dunkirk, Jason muttered. Chapter 72 What's your name, mister? Lieutenant Tixia had already dragged the technician to his feet. The alert klaxon had stopped sounding and left only the condition lights bathing the entire installation in shades of red. Yili kept her weapon pointed at him, even though he looked pale and was likely relatively harmless. Suddenly he snapped to attention. Corporal Roger Daysmith, Designator Kilowatt 6084. Yili and Zoni looked at each other. I wish to speak to a neutral representative of... Relax, Corporal. You're not a prisoner of war, Yili interrupted. Daysmith didn't respond immediately, although by his manner it looked as if he were trying to figure out why two unidentified women were holding him at gunpoint. Yili and Zoni retreated a few steps and conferred. He's a Skywatch Marine Corporal and he doesn't recognize our uniforms? Zoni whispered. Yili raised an eyebrow. What is going on around here? She asked rhetorically. Her Corporal, what's your unit and who is your commanding officer? Yili asked. Daysmith hesitated. That information is on a need. I asked you a question, Corporal. The tone in the engineer's voice left no room for interpretation. More hesitation. Do you not recognize my unit insignia, mister? Just what kind of Skywatch operation promotes someone who doesn't recognize his own uniforms to Corporal? She's a fleet officer, Daysmith, Zoni added, and so am I. You don't get a choice here. What unit are you with? Second Squad, 12th Marine Recon. Daysmith, if you want to become a prisoner of war, you're well on your way, Yili replied. 
There are three recon divisions. Your unit doesn't exist. Tell me another story and we'll just turn you over to Colonel Moody and see what he thinks of guys named Roger who play Marine. I have no duty to answer to either of you, Daysmith sneered. Yili advanced. You took a shot at us, Corporal. Last chance. We are servants of the Ithis, Daysmith whispered ominously. His hand went to his mouth. Zoni grabbed his wrist, but it was too late. A vial fell from his hand and all three fell to the floor in a desperate scramble. Seconds later, all the color drained from Daysmith's face and he stopped moving, eyes staring. Yili slammed her fists against the floor in frustration. Back to square one, Zoni said absently. Lieutenant Curtis paused, arms around her knees as if either gathering strength or trying to recover from what she had just seen. Perhaps it was a little of both. At least now we know who is shooting at us. Chapter 73 No need to be apprehensive, Commander. We're not savages. The slender woman reclined attractively at the Dunkirk's con. Her feet were propped up on the pilot's console. The forward view screen showed several other ships in formation with the much larger strike cruiser. They all looked a bit worse for wear, but to a trained eye, they also looked more than a little formidable. Each was colorfully painted with an avian motif. The flagship of the squadron was built on a long-since-retired war frigate hull decorated like an enormous golden condor, but it had been heavily modified to the point where its visible armament was at least a match for the next larger class. Like her captain, one could only guess at its hidden weapons. All six of its escorts also had visibly overbuilt engines. You like my ship? Made it myself, the woman said with a nod to the view screen. Forgive me, I've been impolite. Captain Cerilia Lorleon, at your service. She touched the brim of her hat politely. What is it you want, madam? Commander DeMay replied. His entire crew had been led to the bridge at rifle point. Captain Lorleon was attended by what DeMay guessed was her second in command. He didn't speak. The expression on his face was somewhere between contentment and menace. I suppose the crude answer would be, I want this ship but I'm a little harder to satisfy than that, Commander. I've been watching my favorite young man for some time, and I'm always intrigued when I see a Skywatch captain do something reckless and against regulations. Sending a ship of the line roaring off into space with less than ten people aboard? Now that sounds like desperation. I'm not at liberty. Lorleon held up a gloved hand. Please, I already know more about this mission than you do. I know what you're trying to do and why. I just want to hear it from the source. Open the channel, please. Cerilia walked her heels along the edge of the pilot's console until the chair swiveled enough to face the forward view screen. An instant later, the face of Captain Jason Hunter appeared. Dunkirk, what is the meaning of this? He barked. Well, Captain, it seems now I have two things you want, Lorleon purred. Cerilia, what the hell are you doing aboard my ship? Well, at this point, I wouldn't say it's your ship. After all, you left this nice young man in command and sent him off on a very dangerous mission. Such an honest-looking officer, too. The least you could have done is send someone to keep him company. So I volunteered. So help me, if you've done anything to my crew. They're right behind me, unharmed. Why do you all think I'm so bloodthirsty? She put on a show of acting hurt. I'm just trying to make a living. Times are tough. You know how it is. We don't have time for games, Cerilia. There's a big fleet with very big guns coming after us. I need the Dunkirk released, or they're going to come after you next. Big fat ships commanded by big fat men? The fattest. Simple game, Captain. I'll give you the gun on Barker's asteroid. You give me the Dunkirk. Call her missing in action. You know I can't hand over a ship of the line, Cerilia. I'd be hanged for piracy, and they'd court-martial my coffin. Oh, I wouldn't let them do that to you, Jason. It's just that it's so roomy on this bridge. I could see myself enjoying a new flagship. Think of the war paint we could decorate her with. Cerilia. I'm just giving you a chance to stop putting all your handsomest officers in harm's way, Captain. All right, hypothetically. Suppose I can get you something equivalent to Dunkirk. I'm listening, Cerilia replied with a twinkle and a smile. First tell me how you're going to deliver Barker's asteroid on your own. I didn't say I was going to do it on my own. I'll need these strong young men to help. But let's just say I've got knowledge of that particular rock that certain battleship captains lack. Hunter's eyebrow rose, and he regarded the pirate captain with a combination of annoyance and resignation. Fair enough. 
You get me that asteroid and I'll arrange for the Gitarn patrols in Sector 19 to be in the wrong routes often enough for you to fill a ship or two with triluminum ore. How boring. You can buy two Dunkirks with a shipment of refined triluminum, Cerulea. Don't try to be sympathetic. I already have the Dunkirk and I don't have to go chase down a bunch of ore for it, and I don't have to give away my secrets either. At least meet me halfway, Captain. You really want to spend the next six months dodging patrol frigates? That's going to be a lot tougher on the paint than my plan. Lorleon looked askance at Hunter. Three shiploads and not an ounce less, and you owe me one. She folded her arms and pretended to look put upon. Done. Hunter smiled and Cerulea couldn't help herself. One of these days that boyish charm isn't going to work on me anymore, Captain Hunter. She sarcastically emphasized the rank. I plan to rely on it my whole career. Please relinquish command to Mr. DeMay and coordinate with his crew. Hunter out. Cerulea raised an eyebrow at DeMay a moment after the view screen switched back to Argent's emblem. That went better than expected, Toby said with an expression somewhere between recently escaped from pursuing wolves and mute shock. Only because your captain is irresistibly delicious, Lorleon replied. Any other Skywatch officer would have been left with nothing but an ion trail. Chapter 74 Possible emissions change in targets designated King 2 bearing 178 Mark 10 range now closing on a 1.7 Delta. CIC acknowledge. The officer manning the Skywatch command console was literally standing at the nerve center of the Argent's massive electronic sensor and scanner arrays. Anything that moved, emitted a signal, or any kind of energy within 30 million miles of where he was standing would instantly show up on any one of more than a hundred readouts. It wasn't a mistake he was also standing above every other location aboard the ship. The Skywatch station aboard a strike battleship was more or less the control tower for all of the vessel's flight operations. Its sister station was the Combat Information Center, which performed the same function for the vessel's weaponry. The coordination between Skywatch, CIC, and Force Command on the bridge was what made ships in Argent's class so formidable. They didn't have the numbers of fighters a true carrier could muster, nor did they have the firepower of a true battleship, but they were good enough at either combat role to rarely be underestimated. Affirmative, Skywatch. CIC confirms. Stand by on this channel. The gray phone above the con buzzed. Captain Hunter reached up and grabbed it out of its thick metal hook. Bridge. He listened carefully. Acknowledged. Maintain alert status. He slammed the receiver back into its cradle. Get me an update on our flight readiness. King 2 is accelerating to launch speed. Signals, raise Ajax and Minstrel on secure frequency. Lieutenant Velasquez performed a readiness sweep of all alert spacecraft from the flight operations station. The activity on all three of Argent's flight decks was brisk. Two complete watch rotations were at work arming four of the flagship's five fighter combat squadrons. Avatars representing each of the lethal little ships turned green as they were linked into the battle space telemetry and communications network. Flight 1 Prep Squadron 994 proceeding in combat order. Jets in 30. Inside the spacious flight deck, yellow jacket fighters emblazoned with the fanciful crimson flags, swords, and grinning pirates of the storied red buccaneers rose from their ordnance platforms one by one and turned towards their respective rail tunnels. The high-pitched whine of their atmospheric thrusters mixed with the low hum of strengthening magnetic and anti-gravity fields. Red rotating lights flashed under each fighter's hull. Deck crews backed away to safe distances after detaching fuel and telemetry equipment. Each fighter followed the signals from its respective deck stacker, a skywatch term for the flight crew member tasked with directing spacecraft to and from fueling, arming, flight check, and launch stations. Moments later, flight leader Harrison March's yellow jacket attack fighter locked into position inside the deck's first launch tunnel. Other fighters followed, each floating into its own launcher at 15-second intervals. It was a highly choreographed precision maneuver that put 11 heavily armed fighters one order away from rocketing into space at 2,000 miles per hour. Velasquez hung up his own handset. Flight 1 reports Squadron 994 standing by to launch at your command, sir. Meanwhile, on the starboard side of the ship on Flight Deck 3, the exact same dance was being performed by the 17 Wildcat fighters of Argent Squadron 85, known as Los Gatos. 
All of Fighting 85's hulls were painted night black and decorated with silver sword blades along their lateral edges. With exactly the same precision and speed, the first twelve ships were loaded into rail launchers and ready signals were flashed to the bridge and to the Skywatch station in Argent's tower. Flight 2's situation was a little different. The largest of Argent's three flight decks was constructed to launch both fighters and their larger sisters, the corvettes, paladins, and gunships. T-Hawk Green was first in the combat readiness rotation for second watch. Because of the larger sizes of their ships, Flight 2 had six heavy rail tunnels instead of the twelve smaller versions installed in the outer decks. It still meant they could put the entire eleven-strong T-Hawk squadron in space in under sixty seconds if necessary. Moments after receiving the alert signal, Flight 2 notified the bridge T-Hawk Green was standing by. The sharp-pointed arms of Argent's unique weapons platforms loomed over the flight crews as they waited their turn. Lieutenant Velasquez turned to the con with the handset to his ear. Flight 2 is green. All decks show ready. Signals raised the Ajax. A few moments later, Commander Harcourt appeared on the Argent's main screen. Behind him, the tough little frigate's bridge was alive with activity. Ajax, Harcourt? Commander, we've got some traveling companions standing by to assist. What is your status? Hunter's voice was full of confidence. Ajax will take the southeast picket. Minstrel will cover the front door, sir. Acknowledged. T-Hawk Green will be standing by to back you up. We will have three combat space patrols on a rotating watch in the saddle. King 2 is accelerating and we expect Orca to launch any moment. If any hostile fighters break range, they get one warning. Clear? As a bell, sir. Ajax out. Get me the fury, Hunter said as he picked up the armaments report for the three squadrons awaiting his launch order. Fury, Hunter. Tell Anora I'm doing my best to match her mastery of the combat space patrol, Jason said without looking up. I'm sure she'll be gratified to hear it, sir. We can't confirm any launch or hostile action from King 2, but they are closing range. Agreed. I just found another ace in the hole. Either that or a joker. We'll find out when we get to a decision. I have ETA to uniform tango at 31 minutes present speed. Ajax and Minstrel are establishing a picket at 5 million miles, and I've got Jax, Cats, and T-Hawks on station to back them up. What is our battle group status? Revenge, Spruance, Constellation, and Fury are 90% reconfigured for medium-range missile standoff. Exeter and Rhode Island will take short-range intercepts, and Jefferson will float. Sounds like we've done all we can. Now it's just a question of who punches who the hardest. We'll have our gloves off, sir. Fury out. Hunter examined the tactical display for a moment, recognizing that cold, icy feeling way down deep once again as he reevaluated the strategic situation. Ultimately, the Perseus group's only advantage was range and the lead time it provided. In every other respect, they were outgunned and outtunned. Hunter knew either task force would be a handful by itself. Together, they were way over his head. He knew it, and so did his entire command. The only chance Strike Fleet Perseus had was to get the Sentinel operational and in the fight. Hunter grabbed the black phone. Operations, this is the flag. Launch all alert spacecraft. The flight boss on port deck one flipped two switches up and rammed his hand down on the red bar at the base of his vessel operations board. Three-foot-wide rotating white and red lights went active along the ceilings of all three flight decks at once, indicating a TAC Signal 1 combat launch. The priority net switched over, and his voice sounded in every pilot's headset and from squawk boxes inside Skywatch, CIC, and the bridge. Spaceflight Operations Deck 1 to all alert spacecraft, your signal is jets. I say again, your signal is jets. Time out. Mark 15 seconds. Victory 3. 3-5, your rally point is on the board and locked in. Spaceflight Operations Deck 1 to all alert spacecraft. The voice of the flight boss was overwhelmed by the piercing sound of Lieutenant Commander March's engines and the deck-shaking thrum of the rail tunnel's magnetic and electrical charging coils. The rail operator peered out of the nest built into the floor of the launching system. He could see the Yellow Jacket pilot's name and caveman call sign emblazoned just under his cupola. The black blast plate over his eyes made it impossible to see his face. Commander March turned toward the nest and saluted sharply just as his engines reached launch power. He grabbed the controls with both hands as the charge indicator rolled across the rail operator's console and finally shifted green. Tunnel 1 shuddered with barely restrained energy just before the stabilizers blasted all twelve of the gas pressure locks around the vessel free. 
Buccaneer 1 rocketed forward, slamming its pilot back in the crash couch. The glowing circular amplifiers slid past his fighter at faster and faster speeds until he exploded into space at more than 350 miles per hour. Seconds later, his heavily armed little craft punched up to more than 2,300 miles per hour. On the opposite side of Argent, the same ritual played out for Lieutenant Jonathan Tichborn's Gato Uno, dubbed El Jefe by his squadron. A quick salute, and his black sword-emblazoned ship surged forward, propelled by incomprehensible power. Los Gatos were officially on patrol. Then Lieutenant J.G. Eileen Walsh, callsign Meerkat, saluted the emblem and slammed both feet down against the gas locks. A moment later, Buccaneer 4 blasted free of Argent's flight deck. Seconds later, one of the double-sized rail tunnels along Argent's ventral hull glowed to life. Inside, the lethal weapon points of T-Hawk 5 twisted and folded towards her center axis as her drive field steadily powered up around her menacingly dark hull. The anti-magnetic energy of the gunship's interdiction systems reacted with the apocalyptic voltage inside the rail tunnel, providing the additional energy necessary to accelerate a much larger ship to launch velocity. The pilot saluted the emblem and clamped both hands around the vessel's grip triggers. T-Hawk 5's engines exploded to life and caught the leading edge of the magnetic force before the ship roared out of the rail tunnel at hundreds of miles an hour. Within seconds, it banked into formation with Buccaneer 1, like a bald eagle maneuvering into formation with a flock of sparrows, and set course for the first rally point. Behind her, Gato Cinco flashed into space, followed by Buccaneers 2 and 7 and then T-Hawk 8. In the space of only three minutes and change, DSS Argent had launched a mighty wave of fighters and gunships. Chapter 75 They've got power down here, there's no question about it. This asteroid has been involved in everything we've seen so far, Yili said. So why didn't they maintain fire against Argent? Zoni asked, examining the discharged little alien device she had used to teleport herself and Curtis to the battle station. Yili suddenly stopped and stared at the control systems. They were part of an out-of-the-way valve control console, unremarkable in virtually every respect except for the information they were conveying to Argent's chief engineer. That's impossible, she half-whispered. Zoni looked up. Unable to interpret whatever Curtis was seeing, she turned instead to trying to decipher the pale look on Yili's face. She stood. What is it? They're not using power the way we do, Curtis replied, coaxing as much information out of the relatively underpowered little terminal as she could. Look at this. A colorful chart with undulating bands displayed across it appeared. That's a frequency map, Zoni said. Why would they need that in the power grid for a battle station's weapons? Because they're using pico-frequency communications to drive a matter-energy conversion field, somehow they've found a way to synchronize the EM waveforms with the energy field they are maintaining. It rapidly dawned on Zoni what the implications were. The Dunkirk? Exactly. We had to generate our own energy field with the SRS emitters. Once we synchronized it, we opened a gateway to wherever the captain ended up and brought him and the out-of-phase ship back to our space. This Ithis Daysmith was shouting about must use this as the whole basis of their technology. They can project energy or matter through ultra-high frequency transmissions. Hold on a second, Zoni replied, pointing at the frequency map again. Those wavelengths are so short we can barely pick them out at ranges of a few feet. Getting a Pico transmission across the room would take a couple hundred watts. Getting one from Argent to here would take tens of millions. Where are they getting the power? They only had enough for one shot from this gun. The theory is that once you sync the communications frequency with the energy signature, you get a hyper-efficient field density. It's like the opposite of a scattering field. If you plug in the right numbers, the field stabilizes at a given frequency, which means you don't use power at one end to jump to the other because... because you draw power from the energy field itself, like an electric train. Exactly, Lieutenant. Yili switched the display back to the asteroid's energy system. And now that we know what to look for, we won't make the mistake of thinking this. She pointed at one of the large structures in the schematic. Is some kind of energy production node instead of a life support processor. Everything they've got down here is designed to keep humans alive. I'll bet you a steak dinner they set up that gun to draw energy from the exact same field that weird little teleporter uses. Zoni was already busy fiddling with the device's controls. Now that they had a working hypothesis, she was only a step or two away from proving it. 
I'm pretty sure I know what they did, she muttered as she turned the object over and over. A few moments later it lit up again, bathing the room in a soothing yellow glow. That thing just ties into the same field signature, doesn't it? As long as you've got the right frequency, Zoni replied. They can't change the energy signature of the field once it's established. They would have to create a new field from scratch. That probably takes more energy than they have access to, so that limits the number of available frequencies for getting matter, energy, and information from one point to another. But we already used the obvious one, and it went dark. They switch them on purpose, don't they? Lieutenant Curtis was starting to get the hang of signals. Harmonic, Zoni grinned. Give me a week, and I'll have the whole rotation mapped out. Either way, we're back in business, and now we've got the advantage. Yili raised an eyebrow. Now that we know what to look for, this thing will lead us to every interesting place we need to go. I think we should be careful about teleporting all over the place. We don't need to. We know this device can map the energy field to physical space. Otherwise, it would be like a water pipe with caps on both ends. All we have to do is use its method of mapping the energy field to physical locations, and it becomes a homing beacon to whatever we're looking for, including, including every last enemy soldier on this base. Chapter 76 Lucas Moody could only stare in disbelief at what he was seeing. Or, perhaps he was staring at what others wanted him to see. Either way, the chamber he had wandered into was unlike anything he had encountered before. Considering the unfathomable wonders he had already come across, he wasn't prepared for what he was observing. It had to be unreal. Yet there it was. The closest thing his human mind could imagine that resembled the Ithis structure was an insect's eye viewed from the inside. As long as he kept his mind on the entire vista of color and motion, he could examine the whole structure and its various general details. The moment he focused his attention on just one of those many details, it grew to nearly surround him. It was very much like sorting through a schematic with a system that could zoom in on a particular section. Each individual hexagonal window looked to be a view of a physical location somewhere, presented from the point of view of a high-angle observer. It was, essentially, the largest bank of surveillance cameras ever constructed. From where he was standing, Mu was fairly certain there were at least hundreds of thousands of tiny, flickering windows, if not millions. The strange thing was, if his eyes lingered for even a moment, whatever he was looking at would grow large enough to recognize. He was about to go back the way he came when something caught his attention. He wasn't quite sure what he had seen was recognizable, but there was something in his mind that told him to go take another look. There. Near the center of the far wall of the spherical chamber was a familiar color. As he focused, a picture of two people examining a strange object emerged. Hey, I'm in here, I'm here, he shouted. The images of Yili and Zoni didn't respond to the sound. Colonel Moody began running towards what, from his vantage point, was the view screen displaying his fellow officers. When he looked around to see if he was making any progress, he was almost overcome by a sense of vertigo. Being inside such a large structure made it very difficult for his merely human mind to gather any significant knowledge about his speed, direction, or momentum. He couldn't even say for sure what platform he was supported by. He could feel his footsteps, but he had no physical frame of reference. But when he focused his attention back on Yili and Zoni and whatever location they occupied, it became easier for him to recognize what was happening. He felt as if he were moving faster, but he could not say why. Whatever was at the other end of the view screen he was staring at as intently as he could seemed to get more and more real. Finally, his mind caught up with what was going on, and the control room where the engineer and signals officer were standing was suddenly approaching him at his top running speed. He started bellowing, and his voice rose higher and higher as he ran. A moment later, he burst through some kind of membrane and felt as if his body had lost at least one of its dimensions. In an instant of time, Colonel Moody caught a glimpse of open space, the upper edge of the sentinel emplacement on Barker's asteroid, and an almost painfully bright lattice of alien numbers and letters. Then, still howling, he quite literally fell out of the ceiling and slammed against the floor next to Yili and Zoni. Broken and shattered pieces of metal, plastic, and stone clattered against the floor with him. Lieutenant Curtis jumped back and drew her weapon. Zoni shrieked and backed into a corner, ready to perform rare and violent martial arts. As you were, Colonel Moody coughed before rolling prone on his back and staring at the ceiling.
Chapter 77 The frigate-enhanced wedge of Argent fighters advanced, clearing space ahead of their strike fleet. In the distance, the King II formation loomed. Both its capital ships were wide awake and active, making their avatars on the tactical display bright and crisp and more than a little unsettling. Aboard Buccaneer 4, Lieutenant Eileen Meerkat Walsh was troubled. Before the launch, she had been provided with all the pre-flight astrometry and battle space analysis, just like all the other pilots. But her instruments weren't responding as expected, and no matter what adjustments she made, the data she was getting was either defective, illusionary, or just plain wrong. Any Skywatch fighter jock would readily admit the majority of any squadron treated pre-flight astrometry like in-flight magazines on a commercial space liner. They might get an occasional flip-through, but were rarely studied. Meerkat was the exception. She had a system for making sure she got the essentials before she filed her data packs. What that pre-flight telemetry said and what her instruments were reporting were at odds. She cycled the diagnostic sequence for her passive spectrometry sensors once, and then once again. Every time the system reset, it glowed back to life with exactly the same information at a slightly closer range. Because the King's Blade and the Orca were both running active, there was no way for them to conceal their organic signatures. They couldn't create reflective interference, and ECM would simply be a waste of power, as any medium-range electromagnetic detection or analysis system would be able to ride each ship's own range beacons right down to their respective bridges. That only meant one thing. If their organic signatures were absent, it meant there were no life forms aboard. Buccaneer 4's sensors were reporting exactly that. No organics. Not a single molecule. If her observations were confirmed, it meant both task forces were unmanned. While the knowledge none of their fleet mates were in danger might have been a relief to Argent's attack wave initially, it was what came next that would chill even the bravest pilot right down to their knees. Who or what was controlling those ships? How were they controlled? And from where? Buck four to flight leader. There was a hesitant pause as the squadron had been advised to maintain radio silence until King Two's advance wave broke range. Go ahead, Buck Four, came the response. Eileen couldn't be sure, but Commander March's voice sounded tight and annoyed. So Meerkat decided to just go with the facts and by the book. The fighter wings maintained their formations, knifing through space at nearly 500 miles a second. Sir, my forward sensors are showing no life forms on any ship in Formation King Two. I've bounced the system twice, and I can only reconfirm my readings. There's nobody aboard those ships. Before Commander March could respond, an impossibly powerful explosion ripped a hole in space only half a light second forward of the leading Argent squadron. Reactive hatches and blast plates went dark to shield the pilots from the intense brightness. By the time their instruments cleared, three dozen DSS Orca fighters were screaming through writhing hundred-mile-long plasma fires directly into the teeth of the Argent attack wave. Chapter 78 Confirmed, Dunkirk. The Sentinel is operational. We... The Argent transmission was overwhelmed by a surge of electronic noise. For a soundless moment, Captain Cerilia Lorleon and Commander Toby DeMay stared at each other, their respective tactical and strategic minds coming to exactly opposite conclusions. We've got to take out that gun, DeMay announced. He moved quickly to man the bridge engineering station. You don't have the firepower or the standoff capability for that kind of assault, Commander, Lorleon replied. And neither do we. Get your crew and join us aboard my Corsair. We can approach that battle station by stealth and get you on the ground without firing a shot. I'm not abandoning my command, DeMay snapped, eyes intent on his engineering readouts. You were sent on a desperation mission that could only succeed against an abandoned or inactive installation. If that thing is operational, it will swat you out of space like an insect the moment you reach the perimeter. It's a suicide run, Commander. DeMay looked up. Are you asking me to trust you? I still have a wound on my neck from our first meeting. His expression was as deadpan as he could make it. For all he knew, that sentinel was already lining up a shot at his engine room. Or worse. Lorleon walked across the bridge with a determined expression and stopped inches from her opposite number. Her bearing was unmistakable. She was a woman used to being listened to and unaccustomed to being doubted. Her eyes burned as she replied. I'm asking you if you want to be alive when this mission is over, Commander. And I only ask those kinds of questions once. You don't have the manpower to put this ship in the fight and you know it. 
If you want to hurl yourself on your sword out of some misguided sense of duty, I'm not going to stop you. I'm also not going to stand here and be a target while you do it. Demay watched as the pirate captain produced a comlink. Notify Small Bird to lay in an evasive course for Point Bronco. Energize Cloak and have the master of the ship make provision for ten. Hostages, Demay finished for her. Cerulea smiled sweetly and reactivated her comlink. Guests, Condor out. Toby didn't react. He looked like a man trying desperately not to betray his anxiety at making the decision to violate Skywatch regulations and abandon his command. Without breaking eye contact with Captain Lorleon, he activated the intraship. All hands, this is the captain. Rendezvous on deck three starboard and prepare to abandon ship. He let go of the transmit button with an angry flourish. And I just ended my career. Negative, Commander, Lorleon replied as she holstered her comlink. You just guaranteed yourself a fighting chance to see those gold maple leaves turn silver someday. Chapter 79 We fired. Yili's voice was even and confident. Her words, however, had a frozen edge. Both of her fellow officers had the same question. Fired on whom? So much for our theories about how this thing is powered, Mu offered, still dusting himself off. But after what I've seen, I'd be willing to believe these beasts can do just about anything. They're advanced, no question about that, Yilly replied. Diamond Jack over there fit the two pieces of the map together for us. Good. Then you'll both be a big help when I lock Atwell in a box and ship him back to a five-flag court-martial. He's back on the Ithis planet or whatever it is. They've got Hughes and they're doing something to his mind. Their next target is the captain. The lights dimmed and the station shuddered as what all three officers presumed was another shot went off. Whatever our plans are, we need to make room for the war that just started up there, Zoni said as she scanned the ceiling for clues as to when the next shot might happen. They may have engaged the Dunkirk. Yilly pointed out. Demay's orders were to commandeer this installation. If that sentinel opens up on his ship, they'll be pulverized. Even with a full crew, the Dunkirk can't take that kind of pounding. Even Argent would have her hands full, Moose said. We've got to sabotage it before whatever these people are shooting at is destroyed. Agreed, sir, Zoni replied. There's a couple of things you should know. We figured out their power system. If they're using it to drive this installation, we can't cut the power conventionally. Signals is right, Yili said. They're using a matter-energy transmission field. The only way to disrupt it is with a scattering technology. Even if we had the hardware, we don't have the power. Recommendations? These guys are fanatics, Zoni replied. Corporal Daysmith over there took himself out after we saw through his Skywatch story. If we do this the old-fashioned way, it's going to be a slugging match to get to the controls and power down the gun. If we can't cut the power, we have to throw the switch manually. And there's a big crowd guarding that switch, I'll wager, Moo said. All right, we'll see how close we can get before all hell breaks loose. The colonel relieved Daysmith's body of all the electronics and anything else that looked useful. First guy we find, I'll need to borrow his weapon. Signals, you give us direction and bearing. Engineer, you've got the point. Anything suspicious gets two in the chest and one between the headlamps. Moo snapped the corporal's equipment to his belt. Let's move. Chapter 80 Get me the fury on a priority frequency, Jason Hunter snapped. He was frowning and intent, scanning his engineer's message for any other information he might have missed. Fury, Ensign Calamy. Ensign, this is the flag. Patch me through to Commander Doverly. Sir, I, um, yes, sir. It was likely the first time Calamy had been given an order directly from a flag officer. Fury, Doverly. What's your status, XO? We're all powered up. Commander Hunter's crew is working like a Swiss clock factory. How's the fort? Well, it's under the command of a man who should really work on his reading comprehension. My chief engineer and signals officer apparently found a new toy and used it to zap themselves off the ship and onto Barker's asteroid. A pause. At this range? Unless they're playing a prank on me. All of Argent's tactical readouts went haywire at once. The bridge crew's alertness intensified. A proximity alarm sounded. Report! I have confirmed heavy weapons fire bearing 38 Mark 60 true. The combat frequency alert tone sounded. One of the handsets above the con buzzed. Sir, I have a message from... Hunter held up a hand, trying to hear his engineer's warning from below decks. 
Affirmative, Madison. You are authorized to bring her to maximum power. Bridge out. Sir, Squadron 994 reports they have engaged hostile fighters at Point Uniform Tango. A flash of impossibly intense light filled the bridge for a moment and then faded just as quickly. The aft tactical display showed DSS revenge trailing fiery plasma and tumbling pieces of ablative armor. Tactical! Sir, CIC reports the origin point for that attack is Barker's asteroid. Hunter pounded on the arm of his command chair. Signals, bring us up on the JA, smartly. The fleet-wide alert tone sounded and automatic communication systems went active across Strike Fleet Perseus. Moments later, Captain Hunter's channel patched in. Attention all stations. This is Argent Force Command on Priority Channel. Engage Battle Conference and stand by for a message from the flag. The signals officer nodded. All commands, this is Hunter aboard the Argent. Under no circumstances are you to return fire against Barker's asteroid. Skywatch personnel are engaged in combat operations on the surface and one of our ships may be caught in the crossfire. Do not fire on the station or any other contact inside that minefield without my direct orders. All commands acknowledge. As if to answer his order, a titanic blast from the faraway Sentinel slammed into Fury's port quarter. Uncontrolled secondary explosions ripped across her dorsal armor and took out Battery 2. Lieutenant! The signals officer looked up and met Captain Hunter's gaze. You have two minutes to raise the Dunkirk or a lot of people are going to die. 